Hello my loves, Tony here from TL Yarn Crafts and welcome back to my channel. And oh my gosh, does it feel good to finally sit down and chat with you. Now I was expecting to have a super chill summer, but it was anything but chill. If you're watching me over on Instagram, you know that I was in Chicago for H&H, &H, back there for Beyonce. I went with my girls on a trip to St. Lucia. And then I was in Chicago for a third time this year for the most amazing wedding I think I've ever been to. Huge congrats to Yaya and John. You'll probably never see this. I am so so excited for your love and that wedding. Thanks for having us. But now that I am home, it feels good to be cozy and chill and chit chat with my friends because it's been a minute. So before I give you updates on what's been going on on my end, we've got to pay some bills, starting with today's video sponsor, Book of the Month. Today's video is kindly sponsored by Book of the Month, a fun subscription service that delivers the freshest finds right to your doorstep. Each month you get to choose from a stack of different genres as well as emerging authors and then your pick is tucked inside Book of the Month's iconic blue box for your reading pleasure. Now in case you missed this little tidbit, Book of the Month now offers audiobooks as well as their hardback books. Some books are available in both formats and there are some juicy reads that are only available in audiobooks so make sure you check the list. Now with even more to choose from, Book of the Month is a great choice to give to yourself or somebody that you really really like. Now although the sun has been in full force, I've been reaching for some spine tingling stories this month. My first choice was Lisa Jewell's None of This is True where a podcaster's subject gets a little too close for comfort. My second choice is Vampires of El Norte by Isabel Cañas. This one is about cowboys and vampires in 19th century Mexico. I'm about halfway through None of This is True and when I tell you I am on the edge of my seat like oh my gosh my skin is crawling with whatever might be happening next so make sure you're following me on Instagram and that's where I do all of my book reviews. Now if you've been looking for a way to discover new stories and support emerging authors a subscription to Book of the Month accomplishes both. Look down in my description for a link to Book of the Month and be sure to use code VACAY, V-A-C-A-Y, to get your first book for just $9.99. I just want to give a huge thank you to Book of the Month for continuing to sponsor my videos and thank you to you so much for watching. Without you, I wouldn't get opportunities like this. And of course, we have to give some love to our Cup of Caffeine sponsor. I am having a very late day cup of coffee because honestly, trying to get this video recorded was working my nerves but I pulled out my sticker mug which is one of my favorite mugs it's got my cats on it Sheba and peanut butter rest in peace to the boy peanut but we're so glad to welcome pepper to the family and maybe I'll have to design a new sticker mug just for him so today's cup of caffeine sponsor is Katie Woodruff and when donating Katie said thank you Tony I love seeing your face pop up in all of my social spaces it's like a big hug and you know what Katie the feeling is mutual I adore popping up in your social spaces sharing the things that I love and the things that I'm doing and I appreciate the support so very much. Now if you enjoy my videos and want to support my channel, buy me a coffee. Who knows, I might shout you out in the next one. Now let's talk whips and finished objects, starting of course with my temperature blanket. It's right here. Ooh. Look at her, she growing up, I'm so excited. Now, in case you didn't get the update in this year's first podcast episode, here's the deal with my temperature blanket. Now, typically I do a temperature blanket for the current year, but I decided to do something a little bit different this year. I was feeling a bit sentimental, so I wanted to do a historic temperature blanket this year. What that means is instead of doing the current year, I'm doing a year in the past that's important to me, and that year is the first year I got married, which is 2010. Now, with this blanket, I am doing the Tunisian crochet chevron and the forward pass is one day, the return pass is another day. Using fingering weight yarn, that means that I'm getting really into the calendar without getting too much length on my blanket. So after kind of reassessing, it looks like I'm actually going to get 18 and possibly even 24 months into this one blanket. That's kind of cool though because then I get to see that variation, that up and down of the year twice in one blanket and I've never been able to see that before. So I am over the moon excited with it so far. We started in March. As you can see, we got a little strip of blue. Those blues and those cooler colors are for the cooler side of the temperature. And then as we go up, our reds are for the middle of the scale. And then our neutral colors are actually for the warmest days. We are now into October of 2010 and we're getting back into some of our middle of the road temperatures. Once we move into November, December, even January, we'll be able to pull in some of those icy 
icy blues and those silver colors and I'm just over the moon to see those again. So make sure you're following me over on Instagram to get updates on this project. And I'm gonna be completely honest, especially for anybody else who's doing a temperature blanket this year. I feel like I've been so all over the place and it's really prevented me from diving into my temperature blanket. But now having done this project for several years running, I am out of that space where I start to feel guilty about not being able to spend time on this project. I started temperature blankets as a way to just always have something going in the background. So when I have free time, I dive into this or I might work on something else. But either way, by the end of this year, I'm gonna have this blanket done and I'm so excited to share it with you. Another whip I've got in the pile is this little grelly right here. So when I was in Chicago for John and Yaya's wedding, I decided to start a new project. Now the yarn is still a secret, at least for the next few minutes, but I'm gonna show you the project that I picked up. You already know that I am obsessed with granny squares. They are my thing always and forever will be. So I started making some granny squares with just some leftover yarn I had from a project because I'm really into stash busting this year. I just don't wanna have a whole lot of remnant yarn by the time the year ends. Now, when I started this project, I was like, oh, granny square blanket, no brainer, let's make it happen. But then I thought to myself, girl, you be making a lot of blankets and you got a few that are on the hooks already. Why don't we switch it up? So I decided, I'm gonna make a cardigan instead. So here's what I've got so far. This is actually the front left panel. And then this opening is gonna be for the sleeve. Just think about it like that. And then <laughs> this is getting a little crazy, but that's gonna be the back, right? Can you see the vision? You've got this. Now what's fun about this project is it lets me use up my scraps, but in a very well thought out, but random way. Let me explain it. When I do random squares like this, I like to go about it in kind of a more methodical way, just so that the randomness really does come through. So what I did is I went online and I looked up every iteration of the numbers one, two, three, four, and five. I think there's like well over a hundred of them and I need somewhere around like 60 squares for this project. So I. I drew out my diagram, I numbered each square one through whatever it was, and then I went to that chart of every iteration of one through five and started plugging those in randomly for each of my squares. Now each of those numbers one through five corresponds with a group of colors. So instead of having an individual color for each number, I have a group. So I have a group of pinks, I have a group of yellows, I have a group of silvers. I do only have one blue and that was on purpose because I wanted there to be one color that kind of permeated this entire entire project. So you can see that nice denim blue in every single square. So the idea is that every color gets represented. It feels really random, but somehow still cohesive. So if you've been wanting to do a random type granny square project, there's an idea of how to go about it. I'm super excited about how this is coming together. I started this on Wednesday of last week and today is Monday, so you can see it's working up really fast. After the entire body is done, then I'll need to make the sleeves and figure out what I wanna do for the collar. I'm thinking like granny bomber jacket, but without a zipper, I don't know. We'll see how it shakes out, but I'll keep you posted. And last but not least, my absolute favorite finished object that I've done in a while is this sweater right here. Again, if you're not following me on Instagram, you're really missing out on a lot. So let me take you back a few weeks ago. Now I have had tickets to the Beyonce concert for quite a while, but I had not planned out my outfit and believe me, I see the error in my ways now. People put so much time, so much effort into these outfits. I was gonna have to come correct. Now, the Renaissance tour was really heavy on the fringe and the glitter and the silver. I do love a fringe moment. I love a bit of glitter, but silver is just really not my thing. So I was like, how can I have something that's kind of fun and flashy, but still representing me? And that's how I came up with this. This is the Mesh Me Up Raglan by Lauren of Just The Worsted. And it's a pattern that came out not too long ago, but it was on my my radar immediately. I love a raglan style, especially as somebody who hasn't made a ton of sweaters because it's just so easy to try it on as I go and make adjustments. So the basic formula of what I did here is I made the neckline just like they told me how to do in the pattern. But then as far as the yarn itself, they said to just use two colors and stripe it all the way down. And I'm like, I'm Tony, I can't just use two colors. I gotta use all the colors. And I had a whole bunch of this fingering weight yarn from Hobie that was sitting in my stash. It's 100% cotton, which is perfect because we were gonna be outside in Chicago in July. If you don't know what any of that means, just know it was gonna be hot. So from there, I had this whole collection of yarns, pinks, oranges, yellows, creams, 
and I put them in random orders and just went round by round changing color every single time. I put my seam in the back and I weaved in my ends as I went. Now some other modifications that I did with my project outside of just using all the colors is I did make the bottom a little bit different. I made mine a little bit longer than what is recommended in the pattern and I also put this cute little pico border on the bottom. I don't know what it is about a pico but I have been obsessed lately and I also wanted to do something fun with the sleeve. Now in the original pattern you just work the raglan like normal and when you split for the sleeves you just kind of leave the sleeves there. Well you know me I gotta be extra so I decided to extend the sleeve and I put this little like flutter bell on it. The original plan was to do a full bell sleeve but I was like girl it's gonna be hot chill. So I split the difference a little bit instead of doing like a shorter sleeve or a full bell sleeve I did like a half sleeve with the pico edging on the bottom. One of the things that I appreciate so much about this pattern is how versatile it is and if you've ever been wanting to make a sweater and you don't know where to start a raglan is a great choice. Even if you just go straight off the pattern you'll learn a lot as you go about sweater construction and how you like things to fit on your body. I've now made three raglans and I've got a pretty clear idea of how deep I need my sleeves to be, how long I want my sleeves to be, how long I want my body to be, how wide around I like it to be to make sure it's comfortable and then also you have to consider that you're going to block your piece in the end so you're going to get a little bit larger dimension in just about every area. This was the sweater that fully solidified the fact that I love making clothes for myself. I used to be really hesitant about doing that just because I was generally self-conscious and a lot of that self-consciousness came from not knowing how things would turn out. I kind of ripped the band-aid off when I made my Rhinebeck sweater last year. I made another sweater later into the winter and this is now my third one. I'm dropping a link to this sweater pattern down in the description as well as a link to my project on Ravelry so you can see some additional photos of how this turned out. Next let's move into a segment I like to call pattern spotlight. This is the chance for me to dive into the TL Yarn Crafts pattern library to show you something you might not have seen yet. And today's pattern spotlight is the Rustic Rainbow Throw. It is my latest design that just came out and oh my gosh, Obsessed does not even cut it. So I designed this project with these sky high triangle motifs that I found in this book right here. It's called Block by Block Crochet. Now I'm obsessed with motifs as it is, but this one looks at motifs from a completely different perspective. With Within this book, you get to play around with more solid motifs that use mostly double crochets, but also a good amount of color work to add some distinction and interest to all these different motifs. The first motif I use in this project is the isosceles triangle. So you can see that it gives us a triangle with a narrow base, but a very long body. In addition to the isosceles triangle, I use the half isosceles triangle. And that's how I created the shorter triangles that go on the side to really be able to square out this blanket. Now this isn't just a bunch of motifs put together. You create the motifs, sew them together, and you create a set of panels. And then you crochet those panels together. And this is a completely no waste project because you use the leftover yarn to put fringe on either side of the blanket. I love this project because it's great for stash busting. Whatever you've had left over for a while that you want to put in a project, try the Rustic Rainbow Throw. The original pattern uses a wool alpaca mix, but this can be worked in anything cotton, wool, acrylic, a blend, whatever it is that you have, it can go into this project and it's gonna look fantastic. You can find the Rustic Rainbow Throw on Ravelry and my website right now. Links to both are down in the description. Now we're gonna move into hashtag yarn love. And this is usually where I share my recent yarny acquisitions and things from my stash that I'm obsessed with. But I am doing things a little bit different this time because I have a massive announcement. You might have seen the ads on Instagram and Facebook already, but in case you haven't, let me be the first to tell you that I've partnered with Hobie to create my own line of yarn. I just want to make sure you heard me right. T.O. Yarn Crafts and Hobie have partnered up to create a yarn together. I have it right here. Mm. Friends, this is Happy Place. It is a half cotton, half wool DK weight yarn that I developed with Hobie as well as my mom. I have to give her a massive shout out. Gwenny has been there from day one. My friends at Hobie actually came to visit Detroit back around Christmas time. So I got to sit down with them and talk about, you know, if we were to come up with something together, what would that look like? And they took every single thing that I said and turned it into this yarn. And I have to tell you, she perfect. So let's take a closer look with this quick video that I made at our photo shoot.
I hope that little sneak peek has gotten you incredibly excited for Happy Place because I tell you what, I'm going to be talking about it nonstop for at least the next several months. Now I am trying my best not to tear up right now because every time I try to articulate how holding this skein of yarn makes me feel, I just... I don't know guys, it's hard for me to get my words out, but just know that this is not only a win for Teal Yarn Crafts, this is a win for our entire maker community. Once you get this yarn in your hands, you'll know what I mean. The feel of it, the colors, the price point, the versatility, like everything that I would have wanted a yarn to be, I now have in my hands with my face on it. So the announcement here in this podcast episode is really just a sneak. I just wanted to make sure that you as my YouTube community had this information first, but the best way to get more information about Happy Place is to join our VIP list. Over the next several weeks, we're gonna be releasing a bunch of newsletters that give you more details about this yarn, as well as a special collection of patterns that I designed just for Happy Place. And you better believe there's gonna be a dedicated yarn snob review just for Happy Place, so make sure you're subscribed to my channel so you don't miss it. There were a lot of people involved in getting this off the ground, and you're gonna see a lot of my influencer friends talking about this on Instagram and their various platforms in the coming weeks. I really hope you're gonna support this launch either by getting patterns, yarn, or both, or even just sharing this information with friends and people that you think would want to know. So I'm gonna stop talking about it because I can feel the, I can feel it coming, I can feel it. <laughs> I just, um, I'm nervous, I'm excited, I'm over the moon, and every ounce of work and dedication and late nights <laughs> and early mornings that have gone into bringing this together already feel like they're worth it. So everything that comes after this is just a cherry on top. So thanks in advance for the support, for the encouragement, for the kind comments that I know are coming because you guys are fantastic. <sighs> Woo, come on girl, we got the whole second half of the podcast to do, come on now. I feel like part of me is just now realizing the gravity of this in all the best ways. So thank you in advance for the support and please look out for Happy Place. Join that VIP email list so you get all of the details before anybody else. Whew, mm. Mm. coffee break, hold on. Mm. We good, we good, we good. We good. Okay, let's move into our next segment, which is called My Favorite Things, which is just a collection of things that I am loving right now. First of which being power naps. Yeah, you heard me right, power naps. Now before a few months ago, I never took naps in the middle of the day. I always felt like I had way too much to do and I couldn't spare 20, 30, 40 minutes to just close my eyes. But when I tell you that power naps are life-changing, I am not exaggerating. As somebody whose work schedule is constantly filled from the moment I walk into my studio to the moment I leave, but I did find myself kind of dragging towards the end of the day. Whether you work in an office or from home, two, three, four o'clock in the afternoon is just the danger zone. So I was watching some YouTube videos about productivity because I thought maybe I was just not scheduling my day properly. When a video popped up about how important and helpful and restorative naps can be, but only if you do them properly. There are multiple levels to sleep and a power nap gets you into levels one and two, but sleeping too long can get you into levels three and four. That's when you wake up groggy, still exhausted, disoriented. I did not want that to happen. My first nap, I tried 15 minutes. I didn't exactly fall asleep, but I did put on my eye mask and my earplugs and I just sat in my bed for 15 minutes. I can't really articulate how much clearer and refreshed I felt coming out of that experience, but just having that sense deprivation for a little while helped me kind of reset my brain and recharge myself to finish out the day strong. Now, as the days went on and I practiced this a little bit more, I found out that my sweet spot is 22 minutes with earplugs and an eye mask. I'm able to lay flat on my back, breathe slowly, relax every part of me, and I'm telling you, I'm falling asleep in about 30 seconds. I'm gonna link that video that I watched down below and I'm curious, do you do power naps and do you find that they're helpful? It's only been a couple months of practice for me, but I'm a fan. Another thing that I'm loving right now are these. These are the Tulip Etimo Reds. Now I recently did a review of these hooks because they're actually the hooks I use to stitch this sweater and I finished it in just six days. There's something about the rhythm of this smooth brushed metal going on here with this cotton yarn and it was like 
match made in heaven. I've got more detailed information in that review, including a test of these hooks with all three of the main yarn fibers. But for the sake of this podcast episode, let me say that these are the hooks I've been reaching for over and over again. Actually, that granny square cardigan I showed you a little while ago, I'm using these for it and it's working up so incredibly fast. I am convinced that these hooks are the reason I've been able to fly through my projects lately. Now these don't end up feeling a whole lot different than my Clover Amours, but one thing that I noticed is that the actual length of this hook head is longer. And I think it just gives me a better rhythm for the way that I personally crochet. Now you can buy these hooks individually in a lot more sizes than what comes in this set. So I encourage you to take a look at Amazon, even Etsy and pick up one of these hooks to try out. And if you love them, grab the set. I've got individual hooks and the set linked down in the description. And lastly for this segment, another thing that I'm loving is something I just came across a couple of days ago. Now I'm not typically a podcast person, but I needed something to listen to when I went to the grocery store and I landed on a podcast called Sounds Like a Cult. Now if you've been here for a while, you know that I am a massive true crime fan, but my favorite genre within true crime has to be cults. Something about the psychology of wanting to join a group for the sake of a common goal but it actually being something completely different like I am transfixed. I just finished watching the series How to Become a Cult Leader on Netflix because I watched How to Become a Tyrant before that. So I think I've just had cults on the brain. So I searched cults in Spotify and this podcast came up. The hosts are named Issa Medina and Amanda Montel and what I appreciate about their podcast is they don't just look at classic cults. They look at the modern day institutions and communities that you could probably call a cult. Some of my favorite episodes so far have been the cult of the Peace Corps, the cult of RuPaul's Drag Race, and the cult of minimalism. So of course now that I have cults on the brain it made me think to myself Am I in a cult? Like I am low key obsessed with crochet and the entire community around it. And I'm wondering, are the yarn arts, is Fibercraft a cult? On a scale of one to 10, would I consider the crochet community culty? I'd probably put us at about a three. We get really fanatical. We get really excited about what we do, but it's a live and let live situation. You can have your energy on 10 about yarn or your energy on two, and we welcome all of that. But I am curious, do you believe that crochet specifically is a cult? I am so excited to read the comments on this because when I talked to a friend about this, she said, absolutely, it's a cult. I think from the outside looking in, it feels culty, but in here, it's real comfy cozy. We good here. Now we'll get into one of my favorite segments called open floor. And this is when the floor is open to any topic related to the yarn art, small business or honestly anything else I know two things about. So I asked my friends on Instagram if I could do a open floor topic on anything what would you like it to be and the overwhelming majority of people said do an open floor on plagiarism versus inspiration. Now this is an age-old conversation we've been having here in the crochet community because with so many aspiring and emerging designers it's easy to find overlap between their new patterns and some of the more established designs that are in our community. And while the line between plagiarism and inspiration can still be a little blurry, there are some simple tools that you can use to make sure your newest design is actually original. Now let me give a little disclaimer here. I am not a lawyer. I do not work in the legal profession and I am not here to offer advice on how to copyright or otherwise protect your work. I am a girl on the internet who's been designing patterns for a few years and might know a thing or two. I think the perfect place to start with this conversation is an understanding of the definitions between plagiarism and inspiration from an artistic point of view. The definition of plagiarism is cut and dry and it applies in any field. Essentially, plagiarism is taking somebody else's work and passing it off as your own. It's ripping that work off with no original thought or ideas and hoping upon hope that nobody catches you. And it also includes this idea of taking somebody's work without their permission. Now, on the other hand, inspiration involves drawing on that enthusiasm enthusiasm that you had by experiencing that piece of work and using that enthusiasm to generate new ideas. As a crochet designer, that could mean borrowing a color palette, borrowing a technique, borrowing a stitch that you saw in a project. Think about it like this. Inspiration is the launching pad for you to engage your own design style and ideas. 
So next I'm gonna give you just a few tips to make sure the design that you have in mind is actually original. And to be clear, I am borrowing some ideas from a blog post written by Courtney of I Love Tinderbox. I'm gonna have that blog post linked down in the description. My first piece of advice is to draw inspiration from somewhere outside of the maker community. If you're getting inspired for your next design by looking just on crochet Pinterest or on Ravelry, you're looking in the wrong place. Consider going outside of the community right? Maybe you're inspired by architecture. Maybe you're inspired by color. Maybe you're inspired by music. Maybe you're inspired by clothing in your own closet. Whatever you decide to be inspired by, make sure it's not just other designers. One of my favorite places to draw inspiration is from the trend reports that Alexandra of Two of Wands puts out for the fall, winter, and spring, summer lines in the fashion industry. She finds trends across all of these different designers and shares them on Instagram through a series of stories. It's such a massive lift and so much work to be able to pull together these threads that follow throughout the entire fashion industry, but Alexandra does it for us. Consider going to her story highlights to see what the latest trends were and consider how you can use your own design style and perspective to bring those trends to life. My next tip to make sure you're designing original patterns is to combine your inspiration with your personal design style. That can involve making some kind of inspirational archive that you can take a look at anytime you're working up a new design. That might involve making several Pinterest boards so you can pull together different aspects of the design. Just note that if you're going to use inspiration, that inspiration should have more than one data point. If you're choosing one piece as your inspiration, it's likely you're in the danger zone of copying. So keep that inspiration varied, okay? And lastly, make sure you're bringing something unique to the design. And if it's truly unique, you should be able to to speak to it. What about your perspective distinguishes this project from something else that we saw on Ravelry? Consider how your project stands apart and how you can speak to the unique nature of that piece. Now let me be clear, copying is not all bad. Before you start calling yourself a designer, you are probably a maker working off of patterns which are really the blueprint of how these pieces are constructed. But once you take that leap into becoming a designer, you need to have your personal perspective and understand that copying is just just not okay. I think about it like this. I keep my eyes and ears open to inspiration wherever I go. I collect inspiration like souvenirs of my personal life experience. I take photos. I build Pinterest boards. I take all of that inspiration and filter it through my artistic vision to make sure what comes out the other side is distinctly TL Yarn Crafts. Just know that pattern design is not for everyone and you don't have to become a designer to make waves within this community. What I love is following accounts of people who just make gorgeous projects, who pull together color palettes that I never would have thought of, who detail their projects on blogs or Ravelry so I can see what their unique perspective looks like if I wanted to dive into that project myself. There's not a whole lot new under the sun when it comes to yarn crafts. Knit and crochet have been around for hundreds of years, so we expect designers to have a unique perspective on these age-old crafts. If you don't have that perspective, don't force it, because we'll be able to tell. But that's just the opinion of one yarn snob. I would love to know what you think. What is the difference between inspiration and copying? And how do we as designers make sure we're on the right side of this conversation? Alrighty, my love. So we're going to wrap things up with my final word, which is just a little bit of inspiration to take you through your day on a lighter note. And my final word is run your own race. Now the internet will have you believe that we have unlimited funds and unlimited yarn to make all the things. Now that might be the case for a couple of those internet influencers, but it's not the case for me and I've got a feeling it's not the case for you either. Don't spend your precious time comparing your maker experience to anybody else's. Work at your own pace and love the work that you do. Your creative journey is your very own and we'll be excited to watch it at the pace that you're comfortable with. Alrighty, my loves, I'm going to call it good today, but thank you so much for watching. Thanks again to Book of the Month for sponsoring this video, and I can't wait to read your comments on all of the topics we covered in today's podcast. I hope you have a fabulous day. Hugs and kisses, my loves, and I will see you next time. Bye. <laughs>